I don't usually enjoy playing bad games. That sounds somewhat redundant, I suppose. After all, I likely think the game is bad because I'm not enjoying playing it. Thing is, I do enjoy watching bad TV shows and movies. I watch a lot of the CW superhero shows, even though the writing makes my ears bleed. I've watched all the Resident Evil movies, even though they are laughably bad. We often refer to these things as guilty pleasures, right? Things we enjoy even though something in the back of our minds tells us we probably shouldn't. Games are different. I've never had a guilty pleasure game, and I put that down to the nature of the medium. Most games require a lot of interaction. If that interaction is bad or broken in some way, that frustrates me to the point I can no longer enjoy it. In fact, even games I like a lot tend to annoy me while playing because of their little niggles and quirks. I'm incredibly sensitive to mechanics not working how my brain thinks they should. Conversely, a bad TV show doesn't take any effort on my part. In fact, bad TV often takes less effort to watch than good TV. It's why until recently I was all caught up on The Flash, while Better Call Saul sat unwatched. Well, as you may have guessed at this point, I now enjoy playing at least one bad game. Alpha Protocol is a bad game. It's undeniable. Both combat and stealth are a broken mess of systems that don't work properly, and it's hardly redeemed by a run-of-the-mill espionage story that feels like something written by a 13-year-old boy after reading one Tom Clancy novel. And not even a good Tom Clancy novel, one of those ones he didn't actually write, just lent his name to. And yet, I kind of love it. Well, love's a strong word. I had a lot of fun with it. Sure, all of Alpha Protocol's major systems are broken, but at least it tries new things. The dialogue and choice system is so unbelievably convoluted that the game inevitably trips over itself trying to keep up. But there's something to be said for attempting to create a choice system with this amount of complexity. I can't think of many games that give you so many meaningful choices and constantly throw the consequences of those choices back at you in both big and small ways. You can't so much as get dressed without having an NPC comment on what you're wearing. Perhaps the most surprising thing to me was that I enjoyed the absolutely god-awful overpowered stealth system. If you're a regular viewer of this channel you know that I enjoy stealth games and if a game offers a stealth option I will always try and play that way first. I also tend to be critical of those systems when they don't work and I have never played a stealth system that functions as badly as the one in Alpha Protocol, but I liked it. I don't want any other stealth game to replicate this system ever, but I did like it. If nothing else, Alpha Protocol is different, unique even, and I don't use that word lightly. There never has been and never will be a game like Alpha Protocol again. However, in a world where one of the biggest game publishers is so unimaginative in its game design that its name is often used as a genre label, a game as different as Alpha Protocol should be welcomed if maybe not encouraged. As with seemingly every Obsidian game, Alpha Protocol only got made because another game Obsidian was working on got cancelled. In this case, and I can't quite believe I'm going to say this, but here goes, Obsidian was working on a game called Dwarves, which was going to be an RPG prequel to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Disney cancelled the project because, well, it was an RPG prequel to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Weirdly, with Disney now pumping out unnecessary prequels and sequels all over the place, it might be something they revisit. Personally, I am dying to know why Grumpy is called Grumpy. I mean, there has to be a reason, and I need at least a three-hour movie to explain it. Obsidian kicked around a few ideas and sold the concept of a spy RPG to Sega who thought the blend of spy fiction and RPG was a cool and original idea. Unfortunately, Obsidian was not in a strong bargaining position, it needed money quickly, and as a result it agreed to let Sega own the IP, a decision that would later come to haunt it. The rush to get the game in development meant Obsidian skipped some steps at the concept stage. They never made a spec document which would have identified the target audience and narrowed down the focus of what the game would be. As a result, the first two years of development lacked direction and little was accomplished. Even in the final product, you can tell the game lacks a concrete identity and has no real idea what it wants to be. Bizarrely, that's one of the things I'd like about it. The team tightened focus and started stripping features from the game in an effort to get something finished. There was originally going to be a parkour system, however in the final game you can only jump and climb in a few very specific predetermined places. Bike and boat chases were removed, although you can still see Thought and use both. Environmental interactions, such as being able to shoot parts of the scenery and have things drop on enemies, was also cut. The game's artificial intelligence was so draining on performance that it had to be drastically scaled back, or at least that's how the team described it. They basically deleted the eye from AI. 
In 2019, Robert Purchase of Eurogamer interviewed Obsidian developers and uncovered a bunch of juicy details. By the way, this is why I love covering Obsidian games. There's usually a cool story behind development and the devs there are incredibly open about their struggles. There are always in-depth interviews, GDC talks or documentaries about the project. Fergus Urquhart is fast becoming one of my most loved developers because of how open he is about the process. Anyway, the Eurogamer interview revealed that Obsidian spent $500,000 on an elaborate action scene that Sega then just told them to scrap because it wouldn't be possible to do the entire game at that level of quality and expense. In an interview with Kirk McKeon of The Gamer, former Obsidian designer Patrick Mills states that Rome in particular was hobbled together from abandoned ideas and the story for this section was rewritten at the last moment. He also confirmed a suspicion I had about the sniper level where you can't move Thornton and just aim your scope at people. The level feels off and you can tell it wasn't designed this way from the start. I assumed this was going to be a larger level and it got cut back due to time and or cost constraints. However, as it turned out, this environment was initially made for a scrapped cutscene that Mills then recycled as a mission just to ensure it didn't go to waste. Like I said, I love covering Obsidian games. The hacking and lockpicking minigames were initially going to be several minutes long each, almost like separate puzzle games in their own right. They now take less than 10 seconds. Having more involved minigames doesn't sound like a terrible idea on paper, although clearly they would need to be less frequent. Mind you, I'm getting flashbacks of those alien Sudoku puzzles from Mass Effect Andromeda now, so perhaps not. Obsidian briefly considered giving players a choice between a male and female Thornton, but said they couldn't afford it. I know this brings to mind Ubisoft's nonsense about it being too much work to animate female characters, but in this case I'm actually fine with it. Assassin's Creed and Alpha Protocol were clearly developed on very different budgets and having to double the voice acting budget would have been difficult for Obsidian. The mission debrief screens were not originally going to be in the game, they were a developer tool used during testing to summarise what the player did and the choices they made. I appreciate seeing the consequences of my choices laid bare like this so I'm glad these were added in. Alpha Protocol was initially scheduled to be released in autumn of 2009 but Sega delayed it to mid 2010. Unfortunately, this delay was only to get it out of the busy fall period and not to give the devs more time to fix the game. Apparently a small team of about 20 people did continue to fix stuff during this delay period, but as we'll see, a game this broken needed a lot more time and people to fix. This delay crucially also meant Alpha Protocol released after Mass Effect 2. When compared to Mass Effect 1, Alpha Protocol's combat is at least in the ballpark of what you get in a shooter RPG. Mass Effect 2's combat improved on the original significantly and Alpha Protocol looked really dated in comparison. When it did finally release, the reaction was mixed. Really mixed. Alpha Protocol is one of those games I'm glad I don't have to put a score on. I can't deny that I had fun with it, but giving it anything above a 5 out of 10 would feel misleading. I find myself completely agreeing with both 2 out of 10 reviews and 8 out of 10 reviews. In the 11 years since its release, Alpha Protocol has gained a sort of cult classic status with a very passionate fanbase. Obsidian even tried to get a sequel greenlit, but Sega wouldn't go for it, and due to that aforementioned decision to give Sega the IP, that's likely the end of it for the time being. If there ever is a sequel, it should absolutely be called Beta Protocol and not Alpha Protocol 2. Worst of all, you can no longer buy Alpha Protocol digitally. It was removed from sale in 2019 due to expiring music licenses. Before being taken off digital shelves, Alpha Protocol was practically given away, so you may well have it in your library already. If you do, I highly recommend giving it a shot. I can't guarantee you'll like it, but I can guarantee you'll remember the experience. Nothing in Alpha Protocol really works as intended, which means it's difficult to talk about the things I like without immediately adding a bunch of caveats. So what I'm going to do is talk about only the good stuff for a bit, and I'll deal with the bad stuff separately. Alpha Protocol's most ambitious feature is undeniably its decision system, which has so many branching paths that I'd be amazed if any two people had exactly the same playthrough. Think of the Mass Effect system dialed up to 11. There's no straightforward hero versus villain split though. You make good and bad decisions all the time, and the results are intertwined so seamlessly with the experience that you have no idea whether you're on the right path or even what the right path looks like. My two playthroughs were so drastically different that I could have been playing two different games, or at least a game in its sequel. I feel so sorry for those who had to write guides for this game. Like, How do you begin to write instructions for such a behemoth? Uh, when speaking to Albatross, reply professionally three times, then suave once to get your reputation to plus five, which means he will join you later for a mission. However, if you gave a casual response to the third question from Psy three levels earlier, then she will show up to kill you instead. 
oh, and you'll lose a reputation point for wearing casual clothing. Then multiply that out by a thousand. Of course, all the torture for guides writers is heaven for gamers who love choice. And for me, it's about as close to a kid in the candy store metaphor as you can get. Choices are primarily made through the dialogue system. During conversations, you're prompted to respond with one of up to four different answers. Generally, the choice on the right represents a professional response, something serious and often bureaucratic, with a heavy hint of good old American patriotism slash nationalism. The left choice is described as suave. They're going for a James Bond thing. The top choice is aggressive, direct and to the point. The final response is contextual, for example, to abruptly attack who you're talking to or to confront them with information you may have gathered from another source. Your responses are on a timer, often quite a short one. This keeps the conversation flowing without any of those awkward pauses you typically get in RPGs like this. Now, those pauses had never really bothered me before. It wasn't something I'd ever thought of as especially bad. However, this system makes conversations flow so much smoother that it's hard to go back to that more stilted approach now of other RPGs. Your responses dictate how other characters act towards you. Reputation operates on a basic minus 10 to plus 10 scale with zero being neutral. Usually characters have set preferences for how they want you to talk based on their own personalities. Your handler, Mina, generally wants you to remain professional because she's had bad experiences with guys who try to charm her instead of focusing on the job. Conversely, Scarlet responded well to my ham-fisted attempts to charm her. I think I've got you beat. You ever been a pushy woman in the heart of Arabia? Once, lost a bet. Cute. This can change though. Mina opened up to Thornton as the game progressed, so he could get flirty with her so long as he picked the right moment. And while Scarlet initially presented as flirtatious, she didn't appreciate being asked to play the role of a honey trap on missions and wanted to be taken seriously. When I was a little girl, I always wanted to grow up to be a honey trap. Thanks so much, Mike. You don't really have to guess at what responses to give either. The characters nudge you in certain directions if you pay attention. In these moments, the conversations feel wonderfully natural. You pick up on contextual information to respond just how you would in real life. It's fantastic. Your handler provides buffs and potentially nerfs in the field, and usually the stronger the relationship, the better the buff. Not always though, I once had a bad relationship which provided a buff. You may not even get to work with certain handlers at all if you don't get them on side. Now, I know this sounds incredibly basic and video gamey, but the consequences go beyond slight tweaks to your stats. Your reputation and relationships dictate which enemies you face during missions and whether they attack you on site or potentially fight the enemy for you. Instead of blasting your way inside a building, you might be able to talk your way in. NPCs turn up to assist you in the field and even help you defeat bosses. I had a conversation with a source and got the information I needed. However, I upset him in the process and he ratted me out, which led to high security on a subsequent mission. Your relationships even dictate who you fight in the final boss encounter. And of course, reputation affects the entire story, including who lives and who dies. Very little of this game is fixed. In fact, Alpha Protocol goes so far as to withhold entire characters and storylines from you depending on the choices you make. C was a major player in my first playthrough, but in the second, I never met her. It's crazy to me that I could have a conversation with someone else who played the game and mention a crucial character only to get a blank look in response because they have no idea who I'm talking about. On one playthrough I had to choose between two people to rescue, and on another I didn't have a choice at all. In one run I opted to save my long-term handler, Mina, but she hated me so much she almost talked me out of saving her. One character, Madison, I never got to know well, even after two playthroughs. It was clear she had more to offer, so I looked up her story on a fan wiki. Madison is the daughter of a senior analyst you meet during the tutorial, and he can pop up later or not at all depending on your current run. For me, she was just someone I briefly met and then rescued after she was captured. There are television screens in the background in this interview room, and they look pre-rendered but actually changed to reflect the decisions you made in previous missions. Alpha Protocol's brilliance isn't just that it throws big choices at you, it's that it throws so many choices, big and small, that it can be hard to keep up. Barely a minute goes past without you seeing a consequence to something you previously did and making a decision that will have consequences later on. You can be happily mowing through enemies on your way to a goal when suddenly you hear the screams of a hostage. Not only can you completely ignore the hostage, but the identity of the hostage will be different depending on your choices. This messy web of decisions is compounded by the fact that you can do missions in almost any order you like once you've finished up the first chapter in Saudi Arabia. Changing the order up means meeting factions at different times. 
What was an early level in one playthrough could be the end game in another, and that may mean you have help from a faction you've met. That said, Moscow, then Taipei, then Rome does feel like the natural order to do it to me, but anyway. I think the game even trolls players slightly by having choices that seem big but make little difference, such as what do you do with the gelato shop owner. You're supposed to use a passphrase with him and listen for the appropriate response. He doesn't know it and your handler warns you it might be a trap. I tried playing this scene out at least five different ways across two playthroughs and nothing I did, including killing him, made much difference beyond possibly contributing to Thornton's overall reputation. Just thinking about all the possible permutations is enough to get a headache. I have no idea how the writers kept track of it all. During a presentation, some Obsidian devs showed a diagram of all the possibilities, which looks pretty insane and that's only for one of the early missions. Some characters also comment on your clothing, but as far as I can tell that's all it is, a comment. This might be one of those things that's only in the game to sort of sound impressive in previews. Of course, it's still a video game at the end of the day, so many of these decisions and branching narratives come together in convenient ways. The destination stays the same, but the journey can be drastically different. When it comes to making all these choices, you're aided by the dossier system, which collects all the information you have on individuals and factions and can include hints to their preferred communication style. This is also where you'll find juicy information that can turn the tide of a conversation and end up with an enemy becoming a friend, or vice versa. This information could be lying out in the open, obtainable by hacking a computer, revealed during a conversation, or even acquired from the black market. Information on factions and enemies often gives you clues on how to fight them. So one group uses flashbangs a lot during training and as such they are used to them and won't be stunned for as long. These little touches do a good job distinguishing between enemies that would otherwise have been fairly interchangeable humans with guns. Dossier information can have major repercussions, such as helping you convince an assassination target to wear a bulletproof vest or to stop a riot, or it could simply help build a bond with a deaf mute woman who gave you a personal item as a symbol of her gratitude. Alpha Protocol's levels are linear and it's tempted to get wrapped up in just the main mission objectives, but you really do need to listen and read the information you're given all the time. Take the sniper mission for example. So the mission itself is quite dry, you just aim at people for facial recognition purposes until you find the guy you're looking for. You can kill everyone, but that's creating an unnecessary risk for yourself. At the end you identify the target and are about to kill him when Mina discovers that there's something fishy with the information we have on him. She suspects he's being framed. You can still go ahead and kill him, and instinctively you want to, because the alternative is to abort the mission, something we've never done before and which feels inherently wrong. During my stealth playthrough in particular, I didn't really have anything to spend my money on, so I bought all the black market dossier information. You can even buy cheats of sorts. For example, you can arrange for second-rate guards to be on shift or for a door to be unlocked that opens a shortcut. It does make the game easier, but it's great for role-playing and fits well with a stealth play style in particular. The incredible amount of choice and consequence is Alpha Protocol's strongest feature. However, that mainly happens through conversation options. You're going to spend a lot of time in combat, so is there anything to enjoy there? Well, yeah, sort of. Avoiding the combat through the game's stealth system is kind of brilliant. I mean, terrible, but brilliant. Stealth in Alpha Protocol is broken. Like, completely and utterly broken and crazy overpowered. And it's strangely fun as a result. During the opening missions in Saudi Arabia, which represent maybe 20% of the game, stealth was incredibly challenging. As stated, I play stealthily when it's presented as an option, but the stealth proved so difficult early on that I considered abandoning it. I should note here that I started the game as a recruit, which is a special, harder option where you start with no skill points. Even so, it was tougher than I expected. However, once you gain a few abilities, the balance shifts completely and you become almost literally a ghost. The Shadow Operative ability lets you go invisible for 6 seconds initially and then 20 seconds once levelled up. Crucially, you don't lose invisibility by performing takedowns on enemies, so you can stroll up to a group and take each one out while their friends stand around wondering what's going on. They don't so much as attempt to shoot at you even though they must have a fair idea where you are. Eventually you can even run while this is active and you can easily take out 6 enemies before the timer expires. That's enough to clear nearly any room. It's insane. This power is on a cooldown timer of between 90 and 120 seconds, but assuming you take time to explore and maybe hack computers after each room, you won't really have to wait much to use it again. As if that wasn't enough, there is a second ability that turns you invisible. This one pops automatically when you're spotted. 
At first it's so short that it only helps you escape to cover, but again, once upgraded it lasts just long enough that you can use it offensively to take out enemies unseen. So you end up getting spotted on purpose to trigger it. This is all aided by the AI being spectacularly stupid. They tick all of the useless goon boxes like staring at walls for ages as if the brickwork is a particularly challenging magic eye puzzle. The pistol is also overpowered and a great stealth tool if you use a silencer. Lining up shots is initially tricky. There's a huge aiming reticule, so picking out headshots is unreliable. You can perform more accurate shots by keeping the aiming reticule over the enemy, but it takes a few seconds and leaves you exposed. That's where the critical hit skill comes in. Once you have this, you can line up perfectly accurate headshots on enemies without so much as peeking out from cover. This is so powerful that it should be on a cooldown timer, but it's actually just a regular passive skill you can use at any time. The pistol has a perk that lets you line up headshots in slow time. Initially you can only do two shots, but eventually you can line up six. This can be enough to wipe out entire rooms or even kill some mini bosses. So here's how a typical encounter as a stealth player goes down. You trigger invisibility, take down as many enemies as possible, hide behind cover and pick them off with an automatic aiming feature on your pistol. If you do get caught, you automatically turn invisible and do more takedowns. And for reasons that I don't fully understand myself, I find this fun. I know full well that I'd heavily criticise other games having broken stealth systems, and yet because the entire game is broken, it almost feels like it's by design. We're still in the positive section of the video and haven't discussed the story much. I will leave you to draw your own conclusions from that. However, there were some positives that I want to highlight. First, there's a really good twist. I'm a sucker for twists, so I love being surprised. Unfortunately, not many games or stories more broadly pull off good twists. A good twist isn't just something unexpected that you didn't predict. It's more than a surprise, it's a rug pull. It changes how you think about the story. In Alpha Protocol, the twist that really got me was that Scarlet, a journalist we worked with in Taipei, was actually the one who tried to assassinate President Sun. And of course, this being Alpha Protocol, on another playthrough, I never discovered that Scarlet was the assassin. It was just left open. Alpha Protocol does a good job following through on the choices it forces you to make. For example, there's one section where you have to save Madison or a group of hostages. You're told you can't do both, and I'm pretty sure you can't, although you're told something similar about a choice near the end and you can, so who knows. Anyway, if you save Madison, the hostages die and she is devastated and angry with you. She can't live with herself knowing that she is only alive because Thornton sacrificed innocent people to save her. She runs off and we don't see her again. I also liked Alpha Protocol's lineup of villains or anti-heroes. They are dramatic and almost caricaturish, but quite entertaining. I got real Metal Gear Solid vibes from the likes of C, a Russian mercenary, Omen Deng, who works for the Chinese secret police, and Sis, the mute sister of Albatross. They don't have the distinctive boss battles that make Metal Gear Solid's villains so memorable, but they have a similar energy in those stylish animations. So, to sum up why I like Alpha Protocol, it has the most ambitious conversation and decision tree I've seen in an action RPG, the stealth is so OP that it's broken but weirdly fun, and there are cool story moments that not many games pull off. Alright, now let's look at the game's problems. The reason I don't hesitate to call Alpha Protocol a bad game, despite enjoying it, is that nothing in Alpha Protocol works as it's supposed to. Even all the stuff I just praised is broken, and yes I know I'm using that word a lot. The choice system was ambitious as all hell, but fails way too often. As discussed, I used the stealth because it doesn't work, and I've barely mentioned the shooter mechanics. And boy does the story have its share of problems. Let's start with the choice system, which I described in glowing terms earlier. Most choices happen through dialogue, and it can be hard to tell exactly what Thornton is going to say based on the incredibly short descriptions. Sure, you can usually assume that the response fits with the professional, suave or aggressive approach, but it doesn't always, and even so it's nice to have a vague idea of what you're going to say. And when you add in the fact that you have to respond quickly because you're on a timer, you will likely end up saying things you just don't want to say. One good example appears while Thornton is being questioned. The professional answer here was the fifth. For those who don't know, the fifth is shorthand for pleading the fifth, which in this context means you wish to exercise your Fifth Amendment right to silence. I had to think twice about what the Fifth meant, and for context, I'm a lawyer who somehow passed the California bar exam. I don't think it's a stretch to say that a few people would have been lost on this one, especially, but not exclusively, those outside the US. 
The phrase pleading the fifth is actually used outside the States. It's sort of permeated out through pop culture, like how people sometimes refer to police as the feds, which doesn't make much sense in countries like the UK. But anyway, it's not the sort of thing you should expect people to catch on to with just a few seconds to think. That's a minor niggle of course, but the problem with Alpha Protocol's choice system is that it's too ambitious. It's trying to do too much. There are so many conversation options and permutations that the writers couldn't account for every possibility, and as a result the dialogue doesn't always flow properly. Put simply, the story can't keep up with all your decisions. Story elements are dropped or ignored, and this can be really jarring. Take one of my endings as an example. Thornton sailed off into the sunset with Scarlet, even though Mina, the woman he was closest to, had just been killed. Thornton didn't even acknowledge her death, and this is presented as a happy ending. I mentioned earlier how much I appreciated the unpredictability and how cool it was to see big reveals in one playthrough and not the other, but there are two sides to that coin. It's not great storytelling to introduce characters and plot points and then completely drop them. If you don't find out that Scarlet was the assassin, you're left with it as a mystery. Too many characters end up playing small roles in your story which means they have incomplete arcs. In one playthrough I had an epic final battle with my boss from the intro. In another, he was nowhere to be seen. It's great for replay value, but less so for telling that one solid story. The sheer amount of choice on offer probably played a role in having so few cutscenes. Missions don't even start the same way, let alone end consistently, so you'd have to animate a lot of scenes people would never see. As a result, most conversations are just Thornton staring at a TV screen. So you're staring at a monitor watching Thornton stare at a monitor, it's a little dry. While you can skip around between Moscow, Taipei and Rome, it doesn't really make sense to story-wise, and this means the story has even less focus. The news reports you listen to in your apartment talk about events as if they happen that same day, which feels wrong when you've done plenty of globe hopping and missions in the meantime. One mission summary said that I blasted my way into an embassy when all I'd done was sneak around the side and knock out one guy. But really the biggest story issue is that there hardly is one. There can't be because you have such an insane amount of freedom. How do you have anything resembling a three act structure when you can do missions in any order, meet or not meet half the cast of characters and make thousands of decisions between start and finish? So yeah, the story's problems aren't surprising. I'd be more surprised if the story had made sense, bearing in mind just how much you can mess with it. And on balance, I'll take the mistakes and things that don't quite work in exchange for the novelty of playing such a bizarre game. For much the same reason, the characters are also a mixture of bland and annoying. Thornton has three distinct personalities lining up with those choice options, so aggressive, suave and professional. The professional approach works best in that the answers feel appropriate and are consistent with a character you can build, but it's also the most boring. Suave works most of the time, although he often comes across not so much as James Bond from the movies as James Bond from bad fan fiction. The various iterations of James Bond get away with doing the charming thing because, well, they look like this, and they aren't doing it with literally every line that comes out of their mouths. It's reserved for certain moments. Thornton sounds charming enough at times, if not perhaps a little on the nose, but just as often he says things that you'd expect from an internet troll with no real idea of how to talk to women, or indeed anyone. Of course you can choose to be charming only at select moments, but it's hard to tell if you're going to say one of the good lines or one of the terrible ones. I was hoping we could speak privately, just two men having a drink, sharing secrets, but not in that way. And then there's the aggressive approach. I did an entire playthrough as Aggressive Thornton and it was rough. Again, it does work sometimes. I like having the option to be curt with people, tell them to cut the crap and get to the point, that kind of thing. But Aggressive Thornton is often just a complete and utter dick in the most childish of ways. I think an aggressive spy character should be a bit like a bad corporate boss. A terrible people person who gets results precisely because he despises people and doesn't care about them. They're disposable to him. This is sometimes how Thornton acts, but just as often he's exceptionally immature and you just can't believe he's actually competent in any way. This is perhaps best seen through his relationship with Steven. Steven feels like a character you'd see in a 3D mascot platformer. He's got this high energy, maniacal vibe going on and typically speaks in a very childlike way. He has no sense for self-preservation and just wants to create chaos. And that would be fine if this were a mascot platformer, but that silly, cheeky, lol, let's blow things up attitude doesn't quite work so well when you're also supposed to be taking the story at least vaguely seriously. 
And even if you aren't, other characters are, and they don't really know how to respond to his bullshit. It's like they're in a different game. Moments such as Steven referring to someone off camera as Mr. Impatient Pants don't really work when that other guy is being brutally tortured. The thing is, you can make light of torture or do the crazy guy Tarantino type thing if the writing is clever enough. This writing absolutely is not. Now that said, some of the email responses Thornton makes to Stephen are hilarious, but that's because Thornton is laughing at Stephen here, not with him. That's not the case during most conversations. Some of the game's best writing is in emails, come to think of it. Someone had fun writing this stuff, and I appreciate it. Thornton can even blackmail white-collar criminals for extra funds. It doesn't fit in with the rest of the game, and as far as I can tell, it has no impact whatsoever except to boost your bank account, but it's cool. As for combat, well, I've already said that the stealth is broken and weirdly fun, however it's also broken in ways that are far less enjoyable. First of all, the basic act of going into cover can be finicky. In theory, all you have to do is push towards the cover and press a button, but it won't work if you have the camera at a slightly off angle. Worse though, not everything you'd expect to be cover actually is, so when it doesn't work you aren't immediately sure if it's because you didn't get the angle exactly right or if it's just not possible. And even when you are in cover, it doesn't always matter. Enemies can spot you when you're hidden. I suppose you could say this is more realistic because parts of Thornton do poke out from cover, but there's no way I'm giving the game the benefit of the doubt on this one. Hell, I was even spotted once while I was invisible. I liked taking enemies out with the pistol, but it was nigh on impossible to know when other enemies would notice. Sometimes you can kill an enemy standing next to his friend and he won't notice, other times they will come running from the other side of the map. If they do spot you, they start shooting you instantly, and I really mean instantly. There's absolutely no system of caution or suspicion. They either saw you, or they didn't. As discussed, there is a perk that lets you go invisible when spotted, but it has a long cooldown, and as a design choice it makes a lot less sense than just giving guards a suspicious state. I suspect guards originally did have like an investigation phase of some kind, but it was probably cut when the AI was scaled back and then the invisibility thing was added as a cheap alternative. By the way, and this seems almost irrelevant, but in case you were wondering, there's absolutely no attempt to justify why Thornton can go invisible at will. But let's assume you don't care about stealth. What's the gunplay like? Well, I think the best way to sum up the gunplay is to tell you that there is a perk for the SMGs and assault rifles, which locks onto a target for you, and somehow that makes it harder to hit them than if you aim manually. I genuinely found this ability absolutely useless and I was always better off just lining up the shots myself. Anyway, there are four main gun types, pistols, SMGs, assault rifles and shotguns. The pistol is the most overpowered and works well with stealth. The assault rifle is decent enough after a couple of upgrades. All weapons have RNG for bullet spread but it feels less egregious with the assault rifle. I could pick off enemies at a distance quite easily and I accepted the odd missed shot or 20. The assault rifle and pistol are both best at range. For short range combat you'll want to pair with a shotgun or SMG and oh, they are both terrible. The RNG is particularly egregious with these two. The bullet spread circle is huge and unlike the assault rifle there doesn't seem to be any attempt to balance the odds in favour of a shot on target. It is true randomness here. The shotgun has to be one of the worst shotguns I've ever used. It's almost comical how you can somehow miss with every part of the blast from close range. And even if you do hit, it's not uncommon for enemies, including unarmoured ones, to take four shots to go down. I ended up using the assault rifle at close range too, even though that meant dealing with the horrendous camera. I also had problems throwing grenades and flashbangs from behind cover, especially during boss fights. I literally couldn't throw them, the button just did nothing. Enemies have a tendency to forget they're holding guns and charge at you wildly if they get close. I assume it does this because there is a martial arts skill and it wants to give you a chance to use it, but I wish it never bothered. The camera cannot handle you shooting at close range, so this becomes a shit show. As a fan of sniper rifles, I was disappointed to discover that you can only use them in a couple of fixed locations and, surprise surprise, they are also awful. For reasons I'll get into later, I did a playthrough on controller and it was nigh on impossible to make small adjustments to aim with the analog sticks. The tiniest movements resulted in massive swings. Enemies react even more consistently than normal around the sniper rifle. Sometimes they can't hear it, other times they go on alert after the first shot. This is a big deal because you can't change where you stand when you use it and you're forced to be in the open. Once spotted, the sniper rifle is basically useless unless you want to tank damage. On another playthrough, I used keyboard and mouse. 
That made the sniper rifle more bearable, but instead the turrets were nigh on impossible to control. The black market offers upgraded weapons, but the upgrades are painfully slight and you are nearly always better off spending your money elsewhere. I've discussed at length how I had fun with the stealth, despite it being broken. That was partly because it was OP as hell. The gunplay is also broken, but it's not exactly OP as such. Not until near the end anyway. So it's bad and not in a way you can have fun with. The assault rifle is manageable. Once leveled up it starts to feel close to respectable as a gun, but that's only because it started off so much worse. I need to give special mention to the boss fights, which despite the interesting selection of villains all play out in much the same way and are not at all designed for stealth players. Boss fights were the one part of the game I hated with an absolute passion on my first playthrough. They were so frustrating. As a stealth focused character I didn't have much skill with guns and it showed. I used my invisibility to get up close and figured unloading a full clip into the boss's head would help, but it doesn't do much damage. Now mind you if you use the pistol ability to line up critical hit headshots you will do a crap load of damage. That certainly helps and when leveled up it can be enough to get you through. If you sneak up on a boss you can't do any kind of takedown. I get that it would be a bit cheap to take bosses out with one sneak attack but at the very least the game should give us maybe 20% off the health bar for this. The bosses love to charge at you and lock you into a 3 hit melee combo that absolutely wrecks you. You can run away but the camera is so bad that it's hard to keep track of where the boss is behind you and where you're going. I often ran into the environment and got stuck. One section which well, wasn't really a boss fight as such but it forces you to use hand to hand combat with two enemies who are instructed to beat you up. Hand to hand combat is a separate skill you can learn but you can also ignore it and the game doesn't account for that. I ended up having to get a quick punch in, run around the room like an idiot, go in for another punch which often is not missed, then run around some more and repeat. Oh and during all this the guards were shouting lines like shoot him damn it even though they couldn't use guns. Bosses also summon grunts who quickly surround you. If you're going the stealthy route you probably have light armor on or even none at all. You're therefore incredibly vulnerable to even basic grunt enemies. Then there are bosses with helicopters shooting missiles at you and turrets everywhere and the whole thing is just a nightmare unless you are specifically equipped for a gunfight. Speaking of challenging encounters, let's look at the difficulty settings briefly because they're a touch odd. First you choose easy, medium and hard. Well okay, well that's quite standard. Easy is easy, medium is about right except on boss fights with particular builds. Hard is ridiculous. For me anyway. Full disclosure, I did not and never will complete a hard mode playthrough of this game. I know it sounds like I'm making excuses but I just don't think a game with RNG gunplay and a broken ass cover system is suitable for hard mode. Anyway, once you've selected easy or medium, you pick a character type. This essentially gives you a bunch of skill points preloaded into appropriate categories. A soldier is good with guns, a field agent is geared to stealth and tech specialist to tech. It's such a basic system you might as well just choose freelancer and allocate points as you see fit. Where it gets interesting is the recruit and veteran options. Recruit, which is what I went with on my first run, starts you without any skill points. You build them all up from scratch. I liked the idea of starting as a rookie and it does open up new dialogue options at the beginning. However, I did feel severely underprepared on those early missions and I had a miserable time in Saudi Arabia. Veteran is a weird one. You only unlock this after completing a recruit playthrough, but it makes the game easier. You have three skill points in every category. So I generally think it's better to have players unlock harder modes, not easier ones, because if you've completed a recruit run, there isn't much need to go back to veteran for an easier time. This could have been fun if veteran mode was so powerful that you were basically maxed out in all the skills. So it could have been like a cheat mode of sorts, just to mess around and have fun with. But instead veteran gives you an edge, but not enough of one to provide a truly game changing experience either way. I mentioned earlier that I used a controller in one playthrough. That's because I was doing a lot of hacking and I found the hacking minigame to be excruciating with a mouse and keyboard. You have to move one of the code blocks with the mouse, except it doesn't follow the mouse. Instead it moves in increments as you move the mouse, so you sort of have to do little flicks with the mouse as if it were a d-pad. Frustratingly you can't just pick up a controller for the parts where you need to use a controller. You're locked into one option and have to go through a bunch of menus to change it. Conversely, the lock picking minigame is easier with a mouse, but that one at least is doable with a controller. In the end I decided to just go with a controller for my stealth run where I wasn't doing a lot of shooting anyway. Alpha Protocol is clearly designed to be played with a controller. You can only have one ability active at a time and if you want to switch to a new one you have to do so from a menu. That's annoying enough on controller but even more so on a keyboard where you have buttons to spare. 
Then there are minor irritations like not being able to back out of menus with the escape button and having to hit the back button on the screen instead. On the mission debriefs I couldn't find a way to scroll down the text summary with the keyboard. I had to use the mouse to click the tiny little down arrow. Like you can't even hold it down, you have to keep clicking. Anyway, the minigames have issues beyond the controls. They are all in this weird yellow colour, which is not exactly clear or easy to focus on. The computer hacking game makes you look for static letters amongst a bunch of flickering ones. It's sort of harder than it sounds, and these screens were genuinely uncomfortable to stare at. I only failed these a couple of times in all my playthroughs, so I'm not saying they're difficult, but they are kind of annoying to do. Likewise, when hacking circuits, you have to track paths of wires. And again, it isn't difficult, but it isn't exactly nice on the eyes either. Now I don't have any particular colour blindness or vision issues that I'm aware of, I imagine it's even worse if you do. You can bypass the minigames if you have EMPs which work on physical locks bizarrely. Okay and I can't talk about Alpha Protocol and not mention the performance. As you have no doubt heard this game is a little buggy. This isn't how you're supposed to hold a shotgun for a start and there's the usual array of clipping, getting stuck in scenery, teleporting etc. But generally the bugs are the least of this game's problems and they were really game breaking in my experience. The very fundamentals of the game are so broken that you don't even notice bugs half the time. I mean, is it a bug when the cover isn't working or is that part of the design? When drafting this script, I was uncertain about the whole idea of calling a game bad while also saying I enjoyed playing it. Quality is subjective, of course, and if I enjoyed my time with the game, then doesn't that mean I think it's good by default? I genuinely don't know the answer and I think it's a debatable point. In the end I obviously decided I was comfortable calling the game bad. I think ultimately I'd rather tell people it's bad but weirdly fun than good but completely busted. The former sets better expectations. My time with Alpha Protocol reminded me of Deus Ex Invisible War a bit. Invisible War has many of the same problems around easy stealth and general lack of challenge and I lambasted that game in my video. So why is this one different? Well Alpha Protocol takes risks, it tries new things, it has an unparalleled choice system. Invisible War took features away from its predecessor. Not only did it not try new things, it didn't even try to be as good as the original. It had nothing you hadn't seen a million times before. Both games ultimately failed, but Alpha Protocol at least made you root for its success. Alright, that's it from me this month. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I also have a Patreon if you'd like to go the extra mile and support me financially. I've not had the most productive of years because I've been juggling lots of projects outside the channel and only been able to work on this part time. In the medium to long term I still don't see a future for the channel because I just can't get any subscriber growth. However in the short term specifically up until the end of the year I do have a few cool things planned and should be putting out videos regularly. Okay until next time, cheers.